Welcome to Moments with the Bard. I'm your host, Tiff. This is a podcast where Shakespeare lovers and haters, experts and amateurs, and everyone in between are welcome. Each week, we will break down an aspect of a Shakespeare play, learn something new, and discover how tales told hundreds of years ago continue to be relevant today. This is Shakespeare, made easy to understand and relevant for us all. So sit back, relax, and enjoy spending some moments with the Bard. Hello everyone, welcome back to Moments with the Bard, or welcome if this is your first episode here with us. It has been quite a few weeks since I have seen you. I'm so sorry about the disrupted schedule. This is my first time running a podcast, and it's also my first time getting an MA, and Sometimes I think that I sorely underestimated the amount of effort that I would have to put into the MA and also the amount of motivation that I would have and the amount of brain space that I would have available when I had finished my assignments to work on extra projects, especially now that we're coming up to final season and with Thanksgiving break, I wasn't on campus and so I had podcast recording issues because I'm not going to record the podcast unless I can have at least a semi-decent mic to record on. So right now I'm just not going to make any promises about this podcast other than I am going to try my darndest to get out episodes every week, but it might not happen because I'm just out here, a one-woman show, trying my best. So sorry if I can't get the episodes out every week. Also, I thought I'd just go over and let you know a little bit of the stuff that I'm doing. So at this point, this is essentially my last week of college classes for this semester. So most everyone else has finals week, uh, December, what is it, like December 11th through the 16th. But I'm actually going home December 9th, which means I'm going home a week from today. I'm so excited. I cannot wait. And that's because I just have to write essays. And so I don't really have anything to submit or do on finals week. I have submissions on Canvas, but Canvas is an online education platform if you're not currently in education and don't know what Canvas is. Um, So I can submit my assignments literally at any time. So that's great. Uh, That means I can be in Milwaukee and take care of that. No worries. Simple, easy peasy. But I am going to try to submit my essays on December 8th or December 9th when I'm in the airport or on the bus to the airport because I just don't want to have to worry about those essays on the weekend or on Monday and Tuesday when I'm in Milwaukee. I just want to enjoy my time. So I'm going to hopefully not have to do that. But yes, winter break is coming up so soon, which means I have been in a bit of a stress spiral. And I also just don't feel motivated to do my work either, which is really hard because I feel like I'm working at a snail's pace here and I would like to be working at a gazelle's pace, at least. I mean, come on, I have stuff to do. And yet, sometimes I just sit in front of the computer and my brain is like thinking about 10 other things that I can't control and I don't want to do anything. So that's where we're at, but we're going to push through. It's going to be fine. We'll figure it out. We'll make it through this week, you know? And the reason we'll make it through is because we don't really have a choice. We have to. So let's get into today's episode topic. This is one that has been on my list for a long time, and I've been kind of working on this episode for a long time. Over a matter of weeks, I have been looking at the Witches of Macbeth. The reason I want to talk about these guys is because they are some of my favorite characters in all of Shakespeare's canon. Macbeth is always up there. I think it's in my top three Shakespeare plays. I just love it. I think it's Othello, Macbeth, and Winter's Tale for me. Winter's Tale Act 1 specifically. But I just love Macbeth. It is the shortest tragedy, so it clips along really fast. The way that it's written also clips along quickly, and the witches 
are just, excuse my French, but badass. They are so cool. Also, this year, uh, 2023, on the first week of November, it was the 400 year anniversary of the first Shakespeare folio. So the folio uh, is basically the collection of Shakespeare's plays. So the first collection of Shakespeare's plays. And one of the plays that we might not have had without the publication of the folio is Macbeth. So that's pretty darn cool. Yay, 400 years since the first folio was produced. If you weren't aware, in Shakespeare's time, when actors got scripts, they didn't get scripts, they got sides, which means they only got the papers that included their parts. So no one was handed a full script that was written down. They were just handed all their separate parts. So until the folios and the quartos were produced, there were no scripts as we know them today of the full play start to finish with stage directions, etc. So that's why these folios are such a big deal because we don't have those sides, but we have the folios. So that's why we're still able to perform Shakespeare and some of the plays, we literally would have no proof of them without the first folio and Macbeth is one of those plays. So basically none of those original sides actors got remained, so we would not have that play in its entirety without the folio. Thank you, folio, for keeping Macbeth. First of all, I want to address a popular superstition surrounding Macbeth. Now, if you're not a theater person, you might not be aware of this superstition, but in the theater, saying Macbeth, when you're putting on a production of Macbeth, it's said to curse the production. And honestly, some actors don't say Macbeth ever. Um, one of my friends never says Macbeth. This is why most actors choose to refer to the play as Macker's or the Bard's play or the Scottish play. And the reason people think it's cursed stems from very early on when some people thought that Shakespeare gave the three witches uh, actual incantations as their opening line. And as a result, a coven of actual witches cursed the play. It's also said that the actor playing Lady Macbeth died on the opening night of the production in 1606, and Shakespeare himself had to step in to play Lady Macbeth. Another rumor is that the fake daggers used in the production were accidentally swapped for real ones during the murder of King Duncan, which resulted in the actor playing King Duncan's actual death. In 1849, the curse continued when two dueling Macbeth productions in New York led to the Great Astor Place Riot. This left 25 people dead and hundreds more injured, and the duel was between the two people playing Macbeth. Other productions of Macbeth have also been fraught with different accidents, including actors falling off the stage, mysterious deaths, um, narrow misses by falling stage weights during the productions, the latter of which happened to Laurence Olivier, who's a really famous actor, in 1937. On top of this, Macbeth is also sometimes seen as unlucky because it usually means the theater putting on it was putting it on was in financial trouble because Macbeth is usually a popular play that will guarantee an income. So if you're putting it on, it might mean that your theater's in financial doo-doo. But also, high production costs could also bankrupt a theater and had bankrupt a theater. So Macbeth basically doesn't have a great track record. There's even an example the RSC put on a production, I think it was in the 1940s, and the woman playing Lady Macbeth had said earlier in an interview that she didn't believe in the curse, and then she fell off the stage in the production. She wasn't harmed, but it continued on that curse. It, it made people really believe that the curse of Macbeth was real, and it was those actual coven of witches that have continued to have this kind of effect on the play's demise. And that is why actors still won't say Macbeth today. 
Thankfully, however, we're just talking about the play today. We're not planning on staging it, and hopefully none of you are in the theater while you're listening to this. If you are in the theater, maybe you could just listen to this podcast episode once you've left. So I think we're curse-free. But, hey, we can knock some wood just to be on the safe side, right? Um, Also, I would just like to say, if the witches are listening, I love you guys. You are my icons and my inspiration. And thank you. I think we're good now, right? So anyway, let's begin with a quick overview of who the witches are and what they do throughout the play. The witches, who are referred to as the weird sisters by many of the characters during the play, lurk in the shadows of the play and they orchestrate many of the events which transpire. They're actually never called witches in... Shakespeare's play Macbeth. So they're only ever referred to as like the weird sisters. But we know that they're witches because of the incantations they do. And it's just pretty freaking obvious. I mean, a non-witch is not going to say double, double toil and trouble and something wicked this way comes. And they're just very clearly doing incantations and that whole thing. This would have been even more obvious in the early modern period when witches were actually on the brain and people were thinking that witches were real, which we'll get into a little bit later when we dive into some historical context to this play. But anyway, they cast spells uh, in this play, but their actual magic really just seems to come from the fact that they have an awareness of how humanity works and where certain characters' weaknesses lie, and then they use that knowledge to exploit um, on the characters' weaknesses and cause them to commit certain negative actions. For example, Macbeth is a highly ambitious character. This is actually a trait that a lot of Shakespeare's male leads have. Othello is also extremely ambitious. For example, Coriolanus, highly ambitious guy. Macbeth is no different. He's extremely ambitious. And therefore, the witches prey upon this quality, and they're able to ensure that their fortunes come true through their careful manipulations. So, They know that Macbeth is extremely ambitious and will want the crown and will be willing to kill for it. And so they ensure that this happens. Now, the witches can seem a little bit caricature-y at first glance, what with their bizarre potions and their rhymed speech. But they're also legitimately feared because they can't be fully understood and are clearly monstrous. And we fear the things that we cannot understand, right? Because if something is not human and cannot be understood by us, that means that it can possibly manipulate us, trick us, and harm us without our ability to prevent it or stop it. And so it appeals um, to this really kind of rudimentary aspect of ourselves. This is why witches in Macbeth are feared, and this is why witches in general are feared. Shakespeare also dehumanizes them through their speech, as he has them speak in rhyming couplets. Their most famous line, which I've already said is double double toil and trouble, fire burn and cultured bubble, which funnily enough shows up in a song that the choir sings in Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Anyway, um, (laughs) clearly there was some Macbeth inspiration, but... This opposes the rest of the characters, who usually speak in blank verse, which kind of distinguishes the witches as something other than human. We're going to come back to language, too, a little bit later on in a greater analysis of this. But before we do that, I want to give you a direct quotation from Sparknotes. And yes, I am and will forever be a proponent of Sparknotes. This is the quote. The witches bear a striking and obviously intentional resemblance to the fates, female characters in both Norse and Greek mythology who weave the fabric of human lives and then cut the threads to end them. Some of their prophecies seem self-fulfilling. For example, it is doubtful that Macbeth would have murdered his king without the push given by the witches' predictions. In other cases, though, their prophecies are just remarkably accurate readings of the future. Shakespeare keeps the witches well outside the limits of human comprehension. They embody an unreasoning, indistinct, instinctive evil. Ooh. Scary! 
And yeah, I know that maybe it's a little bit strange for me to say that the witches are icons and inspirations when they embody evil, but they're still pretty cool. So let's get into some of this history. The history of the witches in Macbeth. Because the question has to be, why is Shakespeare incorporating witches into his play anyway? Like, why do people care about witches? If we put witches on the stage today in the same way that Shakespeare did with Macbeth, we'd probably laugh at them. We probably wouldn't see them as serious. I mean, witches have just become cute. They've kind of become things to easily make fun of. I like to think about like Hocus Pocus, which I actually watched for the first time this past Halloween. It was so great. Oh my goodness. So good. Someone should have just told me Sarah Jessica Parker was in it and I would have watched it way sooner. But <laughs> in any case, that's what we think of when we think of witches. They're trying to be scary, but they don't succeed at being scary because we're not scared of them, right? So we have to bring ourselves back into this mindset of witches are scary, witches are legitimate, witches exist. So in 1606, this is the first year Macbeth was performed, and witches were still all the rage. England's new Scottish king, James, was known to be fervently against the practice of witchcraft. Around six months before Shakespeare started writing Macbeth, the country was shaken by the exposure of the gunpowder plot. So this was a failed attempt to assassinate King James I of England during the opening of Parliament in November of 1605. The plan was organized by Robert Catsby, a devout English Catholic who wanted to kill the Protestant king in an effort to reestablish Catholic rule in England. So during this time in the early modern period, one of the greatest things that you, you hear about in relation to the early modern period is the Reformation, the transformation of England from Catholicism to Protestantism. This occurred with King Henry VIII and then continued on with other um, queens and kings. And I don't know, it like resulted in a, a lot of tension, even when King Henry VIII established the Church of England as different from the Catholic Church. There were still a lot of tensions and heavy repercussions after this, and it wasn't like King Henry VIII made Protestantism and then everyone was fine and cool with it. No, England was still very divided about this, and that's demonstrated far after King Henry VIII. We have James, and we're still kind of fighting about this, right? And we still have people plotting to kill the monarchs who are in power based on the fact that they're Protestant and not Catholic. So as part of the plan, Catsby was going to kill or kidnap James's daughter, who was nine. Um, she was Princess Elizabeth, and he was going to install her as basically a puppet queen um, in which Robert would actually be the one ruling and she would just be sitting on the throne. So he was going to keep the monarchy in the same family and have Elizabeth rule, but it, essentially he would be the one ruling, and that's the way that he thought it would be possible to carry out this plot with success. English Catholics were upset uh, because they had figured that James I would have more religious tolerance than the previous queen, who was Queen Elizabeth I, because James's wife, Anne of Denmark, was Catholic. So they just figured, well, his wife is Catholic, so he'll probably be more moderate. However, in 1604, James publicly said that he detested the Catholic faith, and he ordered all the Catholic and Jesuit priests to leave England. As a result, Catsby worked with the other Catholic conspirators to take down James. They were like, okay, so he's not as moderate as we thought he was, and therefore we are not going to be moderate in our actions. Let's kill him. Catsby and his group first secretly met on May 20th of 1604. And the plan was to have a tunnel made underneath the House of Parliament. But they eventually were able to rent a cellar underneath the House of the Lords, which they packed with gunpowder. Then they were going to ignite the cellar during the opening of Parliament and blow everything up. So they weren't going to end up just killing James. They were going to end up killing a lot of people. It was a destructive thing they were doing. I kind of feel like they were like giving anarchist vibes, low-key. Anyway, on October 26, 1605, Lord Monteagle, a Catholic, was given an anonymous letter from a servant which warned him not to attend the opening of Parliament because, of course, then he would have been dead. 
Lord Monteagle was loyal to the king despite his religious affiliation to the Catholic Church, and he took the letter to James I chief, chief minister, Robert Cecil, the first Earl of Salisbury, sounding the first alarm of suspicion. Robert Cecil eventually showed the letter to James I once James returned from a hunting trip on November the 1st. On November the 1st, some of the king's men searched the vaults of Parliament, and they found a large bit of firewood. Guy Fawkes, the man who had orchestrated the explosive aspect of the plot, was discovered. He pretended to be someone else, a man named John Johnson, and he said that the firewood was that of his master, Thomas Percy. However, Percy was known as a Catholic agitator, which made the authorities suspicious of the intentions lying behind the firewood. So basically, Guy Fawkes just wasn't a good enough liar. James I said, well, why don't y'all take a second look around because I just want to make sure that this is safe and no one's trying to blow me up. And good thing that he did, because on November the 5th of 1605, Fox was found carrying fuses and matches and he was arrested. Later, 36 barrels of gunpowder were discovered in the cellar. Fox was tortured into revealing his identity and those of the other plotters. The other conspirators tried to flee. Uh, Catsby, Percy, Jack, and Jack and Kit Wright were all killed while trying to escape. Um, and the other eight plotters were found guilty of treason and were killed. So basically all these people were killed. After a few months, Parliament decided that the failure of the gunpowder plot should be marked every year and church congregations had to give thanks for the failure of the conspirators. And now, there's Guy Fawkes Night, also known as Bonfire Night in England, which grew out of this tradition. So if you've ever heard of Bonfire Night, this is where it's from, the failed gunpowder plot in which Guy Fawkes wanted to set off a whole lot of fireworks, <laughs> or something like that. Wild. So what does this have to do with witches? Well, preachers were quick to say that demonic encouragement must have been behind the plot, because why else would these men have considered killing the king and a bunch of other people? All right, so back to the witches. Now that we've gone over how this is historically relevant and why witches were on the brain, James I is still thinking that there's demonic activity that's going to try to take him down. Let's go back to this idea of Macbeth's witches being referred to as weird sisters. Because they're referred to as weird sisters or weird women, it might actually be more accurate to think of them as more similar to prophets. In 11th century uh, England, after all, a person's fortune was determined by the workings of the weird, W-Y-R-D, a mysterious force that was both unavoidable and inexplicable. By the Renaissance, this meaning had lost its association with its folktale origins, but it still had the meaning destiny. So weird still, still meant destiny. For early modern audiences, the word weird also sounded the same as wayward, just in the way it was pronounced. So this adds another layer to the meaning of the witches and that they're wayward, they're disobedient, they're perverse. So they are fortune telling and what they create is unavoidable, but they're also disobedient and perverse. Wayward was a term applied to women who are outspoken and quarrelsome, which of course were traits that were immensely sinful in early modern England and attributed to witchcraft. Basically, if you were a woman who attempted to assert her intelligence, you were wayward and that waywardness might be seen as reflective of witchcraft. So the weird sisters are powerful potentially witches, potentially prophets, but undeniably evil and perverse, and made more terrifying by their undeniable intelligence. Basically, <laughs> they're some pretty cool women. And that's why I love them, because I love the idea of women scaring men away with their intelligence. Something about that just really appeals to me. Let's analyze a little bit more about the witches. First of all, the witches start the show. They determine the themes of the show, and they suggest that they're going to be largely running the operation. You also see Shakespeare do this with Iago in Othello. Iago opens the play, and indeed, he puts many of the events in motion. So if we compare these, we can assume that the witches have ultimate influence over what will be occurring, and indeed they do, especially with their prophetic, fateful nature. This is a huge deal because women are taking the spotlight. 
I mean, granted, Shakespeare's women were just men dressed up as women, but whatever. So naturally, they've got to be evil and terrifying because there's no such thing as a powerful good woman, right? That would be insane. Also, we have to recognize the fact that in early modern times, the words to describe women and men were vastly different. And this is to some extent true today, but it was much more so in that period. So, for example, having male authors describe women as courageous or strong to use a male vocabulary to describe a woman's actions created a lot of cognitive dissonance because people didn't understand how a woman who was being described with male qualities could be good. So the witches are definitely a case of often being described with male qualities or being implied to have male qualities, specifically the quality of power, and so they're automatically considered something negative or something bad as a result. I think this is harder for us to grasp now because a powerful woman is cool, <laughs> but it was not the case in, in early modern times. There had to be an explanation for why a woman would be powerful, and that explanation had to be that she was somehow tainted or evil or a witch. The witches also set the cadence for speaking. So even though they speak very differently than the rest of the characters, as I briefly mentioned earlier, they are the first people on stage. And because of that, everything else, everyone else's speech feels like it deviates from the witches because the witches are able to set the norm. So basically, when you first enter the stage, you get to set the norm and the vibe of the show. And they get to set as well the, the language of the show, which is really, really cool. What makes the witches different from even evil characters like Iago is that even the audience is meant to distrust them. Because Shakespeare has a habit of having his major characters reveal their intentions, at the very least to the audience. So for example, Hamlet does this, Coriolanus does this, Brutus does this, Iago does this. Anyone who's committing anything, they, they might be committing murder they won't tell other characters, but they'll at least tell the audience. The audience is always in on it. But not the witches. No, instead, this play opens up with the end of the witches' meeting, as the witches state, when shall we meet again? So we know that the witches have talked and have plotted, but we didn't get to be a part of that conversation. We don't know why, and that throws us off. As the audience, we sort of expect to be all-knowing, and because we're left in the dark, our immediate tendency is to suspect that the witches are not trustworthy, for they refuse to trust us. The feeling has to be mutual, right? They're supposed to set the scene by being the first ones on stage. But instead, they leave us with a lot more questions. And no answers. We have to remember, too, that because people legitimately believed in witchcraft, or at the very least, questioned and thought that it might be real, the incantations that the witches begin with on stage would have been shocking to the people. Remember, this whole thought about the curse comes from the fact that the incantations were supposed to be real. There was supposed to be some real, real witchcraft going on. So it would have been really scary for the audience, and that also would have disconnected the audience from the witches. But even though the audience is meant to be disconnected from the witches, they can't deny the witches' power the witches infiltrate the minds and the language of every character around them, and by extension, they also infiltrate the minds of the audiences, because like it or not, we end up afraid of them, and that fear is a demonstration of the fact that the witches have had power over us. Yikes. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about affect. So affect is basically, in literary studies, the vibe of a room. So if you walk in and you can tell the vibes are off and like it feels really awkward or you know you're walking in to a couple that is has just been fighting and they're trying to hide it but you can feel like a palpable energy in the room that's affect and the witches create a very strong affect they're monstrous and they have great effective power and a theorist in affect called Brian Masumi he said that intensity which is affect, his, his synonym for affect, he says intensity is embodied in purely autonomic reactions, most directly manifested in the skin. And you can see this reaction manifested in the skin very literally 
and Macbeth, even though Shakespeare obviously had never heard of Brian Masumi, who came hundreds of years after his time, he uses the skin as a marker of the witch's power because Macbeth becomes kind of obsessed with this idea of the blood on his hands after he kills someone, and Lady Macbeth goes crazy uh, later on in the play. Spoiler alert. Again, there's no such thing as spoiler alerts in Shakespeare's plays. These things are 400 years old. But Lady Macbeth in uh, Act 5, Scene 1, she is in an, an sleepwalking, unconscious kind of fit, and she continues to wring her hands and, and, and try to repeat washing them. She's miming this washing of her hands, um, trying to get this metaphorical blood off of her hands. And it demonstrates, really, this power that the witches have had onto her to commit this action. And even though... Um, at first, it's just her hands that are tainted. Eventually, the witches taint her very soul, and she dies. So the witches have a whole lot of power over Macbeth, over Lady Macbeth, and over other characters, too. Because even though most of the time the characters speak blank verse, or they speak uh, iambic pentameter, the witches speak in, in a different meter. But the other characters end up mimicking the witches throughout. So even though the witches don't get a whole lot of stage time, their language is heard throughout the play. In Act 1, Scene 3, for example, Banquo and Macbeth both mock or mimic, um, I should say, the witches' speech patterns, and the different rhyme schemes show up again and again. And Renaissance English playgoers might easily have heard these repetitive stylistic patterns and noticed this. The most striking example of the witch's tune in the human mind is Miss Macbeth's uh, soliloquy at Inverness. If you want to look at that, you can see a better idea of how Macbeth um, uses the witch's language. Another aspect of the witches, which is really interesting, is their personification of the power of threes. One can find threes everywhere in Macbeth. That is a quote from Krantz, I believe. Ruber. Ruber, I think. One can find threes everywhere in Macbeth. I'll have my sources down below. There are the three witches. There are the triad of father, mother, children. Family is very important in this play. In the first murder, the intent is to kill Duncan. In the second, the intent is to kill two people, the man and his son. And in the third, there is the goal to kill uh, three, to destroy everyone, to obliterate the whole family, father, mother, child, triad. The witches also repeat words three times. They say Macbeth three times. So what is this thing about three? Why is three so important in this play? Three seems to have two areas of power. We can talk about the power of three in the Bible, but we can also talk about the power of three in numerology. So in Hebrew, three means uh, harmony, new life, and completeness. The number three appears in the Bible 467 times, which is fewer than seven, but more than most of the other symbolic numbers. Now, sometimes three is used to describe the intensity of something. So, for example, it's not just holy. It's holy, 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 or it's not just Macbeth. It's Macbeth, Macbeth, Macbeth. And in fact, we have to keep in mind that in the Bible, three is not always good. In Revelation, um, we see an evil trinity. There's Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. Shakespeare uses three as unholy in his plays. However, he seems to keep this completeness idea. So the three witches together are a complete whole, they have complete power, they have complete authority over the events of the play. In numerology, um, at least according to Cosmo, the number three is creativity, is connection, completeness. Numerology was originally created by Pythagoras uh, of the Pythagorean theorem uh, more than 2,500 years ago, and it was deeply concerned with the meaning of numbers, and in early modern England, the meaning of numbers would have continued to be impactful. So that's the reason why I bring up all of these examples of 
threes. So there is, of course, the fact that I just explained that the witches speak in threes because it demonstrates their complete authority. But it also seems that there's something more because, of course, it's not just the witches who are impacted by threes. And I think that represents the fact that the witches have such supreme power that they impact literally every other character in the play into also taking part in this pattern of threes. And I also think there is some religiosity. I don't even know if that's a word, but I think there's some of that to be seen here as kind of like a flipped narrative. So Jesus ensures, or the Father, Son, Holy Spirit triad, ensures the resurrection of man, ensures goodness upon man, is a fate of divinity, and the witches function in opposition to this and demonstrate a fate of death and horror and murder. The witches are essentially the Antichrist? I don't know. Let me know what you think. I still feel like I have a lot of questions about the witches, but I really enjoyed exploring more about them with you, and I hope you enjoyed it too. But, toads, beetles, bats, our time has come to an end. But don't fret, I'll be back soon to discuss more of life's biggest questions and quandaries in next week's episode of Moments with the Bard. Thanks for listening, and see you next time. I'd like to extend a special thank you to Brianna Schubert, our social media manager, and Sophia Madsen, our musician and composer, for making each episode possible. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider giving it a five-star rating on Spotify, a like and subscribe on YouTube, and tell all your friends about the podcast. You can also support me monetarily if you feel so inclined by buying me a coffee through the link in the description of this episode. Your support is greatly appreciated. Thank you, and goodbye.